As a survivor of domestic violence and a volunteer for CADV, I would like to introduce you to the Kessler family. The Kesslers will share their journey through domestic and sexual violence with their daughter, Amanda. You will notice the signs and symptoms of domestic violence, how it starts quietly and then becomes increasingly aggressive and violent, and in Amanda's case, deadly. You will see not only how the violence affected Amanda, but how the entire family was impacted. Domestic violence is any combination of physical abuse, rape, coercion and threats, intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, verbal abuse, blaming, economic abuse, and using animals and children to gain the upper hand. Nothing is off the table for the abuser to use to control their victim. Domestic violence is misunderstood and confusing for everyone involved. You can't believe it is happening and wonder how you miss the signs. Often the victim is not believed or not taken seriously. While not always the case, a victim may turn to drugs and alcohol. The victim is trying to survive a crazy environment. The Kesslers describe the ups and downs and constant self-doubt they experienced as they worked to support their daughter during her abusive marriage. Let's listen to Deb and Mark's story. My daughter was Amanda Kessler and she had two older brothers. Um, one was 10 years older and one was seven years older. And so she was the baby of the family, but she was the only girl, but she was one tough cookie. She, she um, hung out with the boys all the time. She was a tomboy. My daughter went to school at the Osage. She loved her school career. She was in a lot of activities. She was a student council president uh, most of her um, school years. And she was in drama. She was very active in um, track and uh, a lot of things like band and jazz band. She was very, very active and she was very social. She loved people. And um, when she graduated high school, she decided she would like to go into the military. So she weighed all of her options and she decided that the National Guard was for her because she could be here in the States. Um, if there was a disaster, she could be there be trained to help people and she always felt passionate about being there to help someone else which we were very proud of that fact. Amanda had been at training in uh, Alabama and she was on her way home and I got the phone call she was so excited about coming home she was gonna come home uh, she was actually uh, had an apartment in Warrensburg. She was working for uh, the recruiting department there in Warrensburg, Missouri. And, uh, but she took every course that she could take in the service. She wanted to be the best at everything. She says, oh, Dad, I met the most amazing man on the cargo flight they were on their way back to Whiteman Air Force Base. And she says, guess what, Dad? This guy lives right here in Warrensburg. He's stationed at Whiteman. He's an Apache helicopter pilot. And she says, I, he's just such a nice guy. He, he's so uh, proper. Uh, you know, he's a captain, Dad. And of course I said, well now, wait a second. You're, you're just a private right now, you know. And she said, well, we're just not talking about that. So she went on and she just kept talking about him and stuff. And then right before we, we hung up, she said, Dad, I think I met my knight in shining armor. And I don't think I will ever forget that. And the first time that we met him wasn't very long you know, after that phone call. And uh, they were going out and they were doing things and he, she brought him here and he just fit in. He fit in with my father-in-law and fishing. He fit in with my boys and the stuff they were interested in. He, you know, we just all were so happy that Amanda had found somebody that we thought, you know, just seemed like he was perfect. 
And that didn't last. Things started emerging that were strange. Amanda called me and said, Mom, this, these women came to the door and were going on about how horrible Mark was and how abusive he was and ended up it was his ex-wife. And she said that I had to be careful because he was abusive and he was evil. And Mark tells me not to worry about it because that's just his ex-wife and she's just jealous. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. But she says, he's, he's not like that, Mom. He's so nice. I, I think she's just crazy or something. So unfortunately, we had a little insight and we didn't even um, know it. And Amanda didn't take too much caution in it and then things started happening she would say well Mark kind of went crazy the other night and he held a knife to my throat I'm like he held a knife to your throat and then the next time it would be he held a gun to my head and then he just kind of snapped out of it I don't know if he was having he's been deployed I don't know if he was having PTSD I don't know what was wrong with him mom but he's okay now well, then it would get more and more aggressive, and she, next thing I know, uh, she's saying that Mark's going to hurt her cat. Uh, she had this cat since early on in their marriage, and Mark was deployed, and Amanda found this cat at the armory. It was just a little baby kit, and it had been kind of mistreated. It had gum stuck in its fur, and it was just flea-ridden. It was just a feral cat. and Not too long after she had Audrey, she starts saying, Mom, Mark's being really mean to the cat. I, I think I better bring him to stay with you. And I said, well, okay. What's one more animal out here in the country? So we take on Truman, and we have Truman for about a year. And that was about the time that we finally took Amanda out of, um, out of the household. We actually went several times to go get her. We first time we went to try to get her out of the situation, we actually had heard he had taken her keys for her car. She couldn't go anywhere. He had taken her cell phone. She couldn't call us or talk to us. She didn't have any money. And after six years of marriage, she never was on his checking account. She wasn't on any of his properties. None of, none of his financial stuff included her, even though they were married six years. We get our car loaded as full as we can get it with necessities for her and Audrey. And about the time we're about to load her up and Audrey up, she just looks at her dad and says, I'll just be back. <laughs> You'll just be back? What are you talking about? Well, I love him. <laughs> okay. I just looked at her dad and I said, you might as well just leave her. Unload the stuff before he gets home. Make it look like we've not been here because she's going to stay. So we did just that and we came back home and it wasn't too many months later. <clears throat> he was at a big training session. He was going to be gone for probably about a month, I believe. <clears throat> and we got wind that things were really bad again. He had beat her in the face with a pistol. She had a scar above her eye in her eyebrow. So we finally went back up there again to check on her basically because we were afraid she wouldn't come with us. When we got there, there was hardly any food there. Audrey kept asking for chocolate milk, which is Audrey's passion. She loves chocolate milk. This is her, at the time she was uh, five years old, four years old maybe. And we said, um, well, we're just going to spend the night. And Amanda kept saying, well, we'll just go get you some chocolate milk in a little bit. We'll, and finally, when we spent the night, you know, we got to realizing there was hardly any food in the house. There was hardly any soap, hardly any shampoo, hardly any hygiene products. We're like wondering what's going on and realized she didn't have any money. And... Finally, she broke down and told us, I've got to get out of this situation, but I don't know how I'm going to afford a lawyer. So we told her, whatever it takes, we'll get her a lawyer. We'll load you up. We'll take you home. We'll get you out of this mess. 
finally she agreed to it. We loaded her up, her and Audrey, and we brought them to our house. She even stayed long enough to get a job. She was looking for an apartment. She had one picked out. She had to go to some training for her military career. She was still, um, she was still working, uh, pretty much full time at, uh, in, well, she was in the reserves at that time, I think. And so she was um, going to go on some training. Well, Mark ended up showing up at her training. I had Audrey here at my house, and next thing I know, she's going back with Mark. And I was devastated. And the next thing we know, after she's gone back to him, she calls and she's trying to make things sound just perfect. And she's telling us, we're going to move to Alabama. Alabama? You're going to move to Alabama? We can't help you in Alabama. He's going to take you far away. And are you sure this is what you want to do? So they go to Alabama. <clears throat> This is the fourth move they've had in Audrey's lifetime. At this point, Audrey's only five. At Thanksgiving, after they moved to Alabama, Amanda says, Mom, come down and visit me. Please come and visit. So her dad and I went to Alabama to visit them for Thanksgiving. So we go there, and <clears throat> things were just crazy when we got there. It, it was all seemed perfect because here was the nice beach house. She cooked a really nice dinner, but something was just off. And and I, uh, I keep saying I think my daughter went crazy. We're watching TV, me and him, and he's sitting just across from me. And uh, she starts in getting away from my dad. Get him away from my dad. He is going to hurt my dad. And she is looking for her gun. And, you know, we... Deb is trying to calm her down. And uh, she's just going... Hystatic, you know. And he gets up and he goes in and he never says a word of through all this he gets up and he goes in and he lays down with Audrey Audrey's asleep in her room and then Amanda starts saying get him away from Audrey he's going to hurt her and we found out later through her friends Amanda would never tell us that uh, some real close friends of hers that said that he had told her that if she tried to leave with us, that he was going to kill us. Whenever we're ready to leave Florida, we're all hugging and saying goodbye. And Amanda always gave the most amazing hugs anyway, but before I got in the car, She gave my wife a very strong hug and my wife told her just get in the car with us and I had already told her that too and that was the last time we saw her alive we of course talked to her still yet and it was the next March I believe after Thanksgiving that she did say no more but he called and and he said now this is going to be a good separation i'm going to be the man that you told me to be i'm going to take care of him and we can't be together it's too lethal you're right what you have said is right and uh, i'm going to make this good but i think he kept bothering her he kept stalking her 
and kept coming around. And of course, then friends um, would keep updating her on what he was doing or talking about them together. And she finally on social media made the statement, I just want you guys to know that we're separated. I don't want to know where he's at. I don't want to know anything about what he's doing. I just want away from him and I want him to stay away from me. And I, as long as he's not beating on me, that's all I care about. The Wednesday before she died, she calls me. I'm sitting out at the fire pit, enjoying a nice night. And it had been quiet on the front. And the front is Amanda and Mark. Audrey, Jackie, and Mark all show up at the house that she had gotten for her employees. And Mark just moves into the master bedroom just like, <clears throat> just like he, it was his. A man, that's when Amanda left and went to a hotel. And she wasn't gonna stay where he was at. She says, he's kinda went off the deep end, but I can handle it. I said, I'm on my way take me 12 hours to get there and I said I'll be there she said no you're not coming I said yes I am coming and me and her argued and the last words I had with my daughter were not the best he found out later that he had told her if I come down there that he would kill me and nobody would ever find me and she protected us right up until her last breath. The next morning early, I get a message. And it's for Mark. And he says, uh, I'm going to take care of Audrey. Audrey will be taken care of. You don't have to, and nobody's going to have to worry about me. I tried to call Amanda to let her know that he had got a hold of me that way. No answer. I tried and tried, no answer. We had a, we were selling off, it was already an emotional day. We were selling off. It was May 5th, 2018. We were selling off Deb's mom and dad's house and all their stuff because they both had dementia, had to be put in the nursing home. We were all so happy and a, one of Deb's best friends growing up come to me and I says, where's Deb? Well, I hadn't even noticed, you know. Well, where is Deb? You know, so I started trying to find her. And they wouldn't let me in the room where she was at. Some of the family wouldn't, her sister and stuff. And uh, I was getting angry. I said, that's my wife. You know, <laughs> my first thought is, what have I done wrong? You know, what am I in trouble for? You know, I don't think I've done anything. Uh, you know, us men, they're in the doghouse a lot at times. But uh, they wouldn't let me see her. Finally, they brought her to me. We went to a neighbor's house of her dad's. And I'll never forget her eyes when she says, Honey, your baby's gone. Mark killed her this morning. And it's been a nightmare ever since. But it affects everybody. And then we have Audrey. That when her daddy killed her mama, she lost her whole world. She will grow up 
without that influence in her life, and we're doing the very best we can. And she said the other day, I think I'm going to start calling you mommy and daddy. Because you are my mommy and my daddy. But I wish she didn't have to. I think that my advice to a father would be to step in and take charge. The victims are just left just surviving, just getting through the day, just getting through each incident and then it'll be over and it'll be better. That's their hope. Okay, this is gonna be over with soon and then it'll be better again. One time whenever she said he was beating her, she was crying out to God, please make him stop. He said, I'm your God now. Our husbands are, are, her, are her brothers. And they're tough guys, you know, but it... Good guys, yeah. You just, you always think that it won't happen to, you know, your family. You know things are bad, but you don't think they're that bad. And when the reality of it, it, it can happen to anyone, no matter what social status or what, what background you come from, it, it can happen to you. Looking at her Facebook page, you would think she had a fairy tale life. The perfect life. life. Perfect life. And she did. She, we don't understand, but she did. She made it look like everything was perfect. To but any, we knew that it wasn't, you know, picture perfect, but everyone else, they, you know, would they envy, no envy her, you know? And it comes, I think, in stages, too, like the grief and, and just different waves, the song that hits you or... You know, something that triggers a memory. Right. Yep. Just today, like, my Facebook memory popped up and there was a picture of me and her. You know, just little stuff like that. All the time, you know. I don't know. Even up until the end, trying to protect her family from, I think, what she ultimately knew 